It's uh, great to be here at ClojureCon, a great environment for learning and teaching Clojure. I met so many great learners and teachers just posting up out in the hallway these past uh, few days that uh, this topic seems uh, really perfect for it. So I thought uh, I'd ask the team at my company, Amparity, what they would recommend as far as how to best learn and teach Clojure. And uh, the, the survey results came back and they said, uh, you should just join Amparity, of course. Uh, I'd be remiss not to mention it. I think that would be doing them a disservice. Uh, Amparity is a company solving big problems for brands you love, using uh, Clojure and building a sweet probabilistic database that I think is actually really quite interesting. We are hiring seasoned Clojureans and the functionally curious at our headquarters in Seattle, uh, looking for people here in Durham and all across the world. So please check out the remaining swag in our pilfered booth over at the front of the hallway uh, and visit us at Amparity.com for those of you on the internet. Great. So I only have 40 minutes, and what kind of things can you express in a 40-minute talk? Um, it's now time for me to pay the bill to Clojure Conj for that uh, shameless plug. So uh, here it is. Uh, we have three different options for what we can do in this kind of time. One is I can give you one of these aha moments. And we've seen a lot of great lectures that just sort of like tilt your head sideways and say aha over the course of the Conj, and those are great. Uh, you can also get people excited about something. And I think if you guys are willing to invest your lives in closure and travel across the country, you are very excited about the language and all that entails. Or I can give you a bunch of ideas. And maybe two or three of these 10 or 12 ideas that I present will stick in your brain and you'll say maybe later like, oh, that's actually kind of interesting. Maybe we should uh, think about that. And that's what I'm going to be presenting today. So warning. It's not a theoretical lecture. There is minimal Latin. I'm not going to say homo, homo iconicity, and there will be no proofs. This is also not a, uh, a didactic program for how to teach yourself closure in 24 hours. Uh, I don't see a lot of these, uh, and I don't know that's necessarily the way that, at a parity, we feel that that's the best way to do it. Uh, this is about building a learning environment, and what's even better than that, I think it's looking at what a company who's been successful with Clojure, like Imperity, uh, will, will do and how we bring people on and teach them. So we are uh, at least 95% service code uh, in Clojure. We use Clojure whenever we can, both out of practicality and out of desire. We have brought on about 10 completely new, lear new learners to Clojure over the course of the past two years, going from noob to novice to intermediate, and many are on their way to expert. We made a big bet on Clojure. We're very glad we made the choice. And for those of you on the internet, we are still around at the time this lecture was taped. So <laughs> we're actually uh, very glad we made that choice. So making Clojure work at your company, bagging up these ideas into some meta themes, there are a few. So for learners, the language actually matters. Choosing Clojure is saying something about how you plan to teach people and which people you plan to teach. Building a learning environment rather than a learning curriculum. Clojure Conj is a great example of just that. People from many different backgrounds and many different priors coming together to celebrate and uh, learn uh, the Clojure language, its tool set, and everything that entails. Using the best and worst of Clojure. Clojure is a very special language. There are aspects of it which we've chosen because of their uniqueness. There are also aspects which are great to enable learning. And there are other aspects, too. We'll talk about that. And uh, don't think this one's going to be a problem for the room, just by, just by judging the chatter. Having an opinion. Learners need teachers, and teachers need opinions, even if those opinions disagree. These opinions mean you can form a set of recommendations and a path for someone to learn before they get their own dumb opinions. Great. So for learners, the language matters. I want to start off by saying I am not a Clojure expert. I've been playing around with Clojure since I joined Imperity uh, about two years ago, and I still have a lot to learn. Um, but this is not that uncommon. I'm not unique. We're all still learning Clojure. Uh, for me, it's the story of the hedgehog knows one thing. Uh, look at this dumb idiot. He had just joined Facebook. He's about to sling some PHP. It's 2006, and this dumb dumb doesn't even know what Clojure is. He has a lot to learn, but he thinks he knows a lot because he knows one thing really well, and that's C. That's where I started academically. That's the first set of tools I used to build something that actually worked. And I thought I was pretty good at that, right? Like types at the top, then your structures, more complicated functions, more complicated functions, culminating in a main. That was how I thought programming worked. And when I then saw something like Perl, uh, to start developing some web pages and stuff, I was like, OK, cool. You can slurp some text. You can spit some text. You can do some neat regular, ex regular expression work. But when I wrote it, it really turned out to look just like C. <laughs> More shameful. When I started learning Lisp in college, I found something called the let statement. This let me make it look just like C. Uh, variable, thing, variable, thing, variable, thing. Oh, I have an imperative program with parentheses. Isn't that cool? 
for shame. I worked in uh, the CLR and, and .NET at Microsoft, and uh, we were building in C++ and C Sharp, but the vast majority of our community was actually using Visual Basic .NET. By far, it wasn't C Sharp, but all my building was in C, all my testing was in C. The people I thought about were C Sharp developers, so I learned nothing. And then people asked, when I got to Facebook, um, outside of Facebook, they asked, how did you learn PHP so fast? And it's like, well, I wrote C and I stopped caring about memory. That's basically how I learned PHP. <laughs> Clojure is not to be confused with C. You don't want people coming in thinking that they're going to write C and writing effective Clojure. We have uh, people with all sorts of priors, whether it's the imperative prior, the objective, uh, the, the object-oriented prior, and they're smart people, but those grooves can be worn pretty deep. Right? That's how they think about things, but Clojure is about thinking, uh, thinking differently. So it's not just hey, let's build a closure for C programmers curriculum. It's building an immersive environment. And that's what makes it effective at Imperity, and that's something I'm, stuff I want to share with you today. But how do you actually do that? What's the right way to build something immersive? When you choose your language, you often have maybe two philosophies about how it's going to be deployed. There's the right tool for the job, where you look at your problem domain, and you pick your language based off of that almost entirely. And, OK, there's a little Latin. There's the uh, shared lingua franca. is a language that we're all going to use. We're all going to level up together. And even if it's not perfect, we're going to choose that and grow from there. And at Facebook, we were of two minds. Uh, we actually did start out picking the right tool for the job. Well, sort of. Uh, we picked PHP for our application logic, and there was a lot of that. But when it came to running something that required more performance, like the newsfeed server or ads, we're not going to be running that in PHP. There's just too much volume. So we wrote that in C++. When we started sending SMSs uh, in the mobile team, we found a good Java library and a willing developer who was very prolific in Java. And we said, all right, we'll build that in Java. We built a chat server in Erlang. The proliferation really continued. And this required us to think about how we'd stitch these together. And so we developed uh, Apache Thrift, which is a project from Facebook. So the good part about this is that you get the best of each language. And the bad part is that you get silos. And there are silos in every service-oriented company but bridging the impedance gap of another language means that people often stay in those silos and not, and not learn uh, maximally. But we also had a big lingua franca, and that was PHP, and we had millions of lines of this code. Uh, this ended up being very slow, not only because of some of the core nature of it, but because we had a, a giant working set of PHP running, and uh, our requests were taking hundreds and hundreds of milliseconds of server time at some point. So, you know, it's Facebook. Uh, we're used to you know, young people having ideas, putting them out in the world, and, this, and it just grows. It just grows. So we'd have, we had this resistance where we're going to rewrite the site in Python. We're going to take a million lines of code of our lingua franca and improve it by rewriting the whole thing over again in Python. So what do we do? Well, we rewrote the language. PHP was so ingrained in our culture and what we did that we said, all right, PHP is really slow. What we're going to do is build a system that translates it to C++, compiles it via G++ with the appropriate type annotations, and deploys that and reduce our working set and our server time. We literally had to rewrite the language. It was so sticky, uh, that, that our lingua franca of PHP. So the great part was that engineers could transfer between projects really easily. You learn something in one place that applies somewhere else, and the problem is that it's very hard to change. But uh, at Imperity, we've made the strong bet in Clojure that we don't want to change it. And this is where we're going, and we've picked Clojure as our lingua franca for absolutely everything that we could possibly use Clojure for. And why does this work? Well, Clojure is a lot about abstractions, and abstractions have a lot more power you, when you can apply them in, in multiple places. Um, those advances that you create in the abstraction or in some instantiation of that, uh, which are then rederived elsewhere, means that uh, you can build something somewhere and have it flow to multiple systems really well. When it comes to learning, the teaching team is a lot larger. You don't need your C++ team and your Erlang team and all that kind of thing. We're all uh, closureians. We're all learning together. What one person learns can apply to someone else really, really quickly. It's easy to transfer between projects really easily. And one thing that makes Clojure uh, a good candidate for this is it's the rare front-end, back-end language. You can actually build Clojure script and Clojure using a lot of the same techniques and some of the same code base. And our UI engineers really are systems engineers who happen to do UI. So there aren't too many languages where you could do this, and Clojure is one of them, and it's, made, uh, it's been great for us. Languages also signal who your company is. Uh, when I ask people why they joined Imperity, and we're a small company right now, almost half the people said, I joined Imperity to write Clojure, right? Like, 
Clojure is delicious to me, and it's just a dessert that I get, either as a hobby project or so in some corner of my code base. I want to eat ice cream all day. I'm going to go join Imperity and write Clojure. And there's some other people who said, you know what, I don't know Clojure, but I want to learn something new. I want to learn about this functional paradigm and grow, and that's really, that's really jacked me up. So I'm going to join Imperity because of that. And 40% of people have some other dumb reason for joining Imperity. Uh, at, when it comes to the choice we made early, we said, hey, Clojureans think differently. And to put our flag in the ground there, to fly our nerd flag, means we're going to attract some, some difference makers. It means that these are people who are intentional about the language they choose. They are thinkers. They make these choices um, not without a rationale. So the upside of attracting differentiating talent to Imperity was another reason we chose, we chose Clojure. So rather than have a bunch of personas that I name, Mort, Einstein, Spaghetti, Travis, whatever, I'm going to create, uh, talk about the kinds of people that, uh, that we brought in um, and how they kind of fall into different groups. So there's the functional native. Uh, there are people who have either been doing Clojure so long, working in the functional program for so long, or are new and very excited that uh, this is exactly what they want to learn. And this is, they learn very fast. There's no mismatch. There's no, no translation between what Clojure is and how you do it in some other language in their head. This is the way they think about programming. The downside of, of some of these people, especially if they're very new, if it's their only language, is they don't actually always know the anti-pattern. They know that something is great because we tell them something is great all over our closure communication channels, but they might not know why. They might not know the anti-pattern and be able to map to that. I see a lot of them at, uh, in the closure community and closure meetups, uh, you know, whether they are really young kids or, or people who are just starting to program, they, uh, they love closure. And when you ask them about closure, they say stuff like this. Um, they are a heady bunch, they are abstract, they look at the collections of problems rather than the problems sometimes, but when they can apply that to the problem, they are extremely powerful and an excellent core of the company. There's also the functionally curious. These are the huddled masses yearning to be free, perhaps somewhere else in another company uh, where they have to jam functional programming in or convince their manager to do it or just find a way in their hobby time. They know the difficulties of the other way to do it because they're living it right now. And the newness motivates them to really go after closure and, and functional programming. The bad time thing is that sometimes they end up in old patterns. And that's, you know, that's the groove we've worn. Uh, and that's totally understandable. Um, one place I also find these, these kind of people ready to go is actually JavaScript. JavaScript people are used to changing their paradigm every three to four years as they go from jQuery to Angular to React to the next thing. Uh, the front end code tends to be the, uh, the end of the whip while the server side is, the, is the, the hand that holds it. So these people are used to finding creative ways to do these kinds of things and to re continually reinventing themselves. Um, they've probably had some functional experience, at least obliquely. They might be living through callback hell or now with the advent of React, thinking about true functional programming with data in a certain place flowing upwards. And uh, these people are also really ready to go often when it comes to, to taking on closure. So don't be afraid of lack of structure. Don't be afraid of the things that you think are missing. Keep it decomplected, stupid. And then there's a translator. That's something like me. That's someone who was good at something else and still mentally has to map it to, to their domain, uh, falls back to their other tool set often. So maybe someone's really good at writing scripts. And you can you write scripts in Clojure, like bash scripts, but that's where they really want to be. That's their happy place. That's where they're a Viking. Maybe they're a MATLAB person who uh, is doing data science in, or, or in Python tools, for example, like an excellent tool set for doing data science and machine learning. Sometimes they will mentally translate to it. Sometimes they will physically take your data from your Clojure system and then go take it over to their Jupyter notebook and hammer it on there. Uh, they often fall back to that tool set. They might shy away from something new, but they're usually a real expert in the other domain and they're great at telling you what's not there. Uh, and that's actually super useful. And they joined in parity even though we use Clojure. Thank you for joining. So what's the unifying program that actually makes all these people possible to work together? Um, it, again, I don't think it's necessarily like a, a, a curriculum uh, top to bottom that's going to work. It's you know, an environment. It's more something like this. It's somewhere where people come together of all different priors, different skill sets, uh, different motivations. It's a learning environment. So if there's one thing uh, to take away from this, it's building a learning environment at your company. So for those of you on the internet that have me on 1.5x, maybe turn it down to 1.2x because I think this is the most important part of the presentation. Uh, this, is, this is what we do actually really well, I think, at Imperity. So take a second and look at this and uh, guess what uh, the big blue square is, or the big blue slice of the pie is. People do their best early closure learning often directly in the REPL and directly by building. There are some who prefer to do it uh, via books and tutorials, and some who just want people to review their code and get going. And then uh, some people get taught by Mark Engelberg. And this, 
this slice is, is not just one person. There's a lot of excellent people who've been taught by this guy. So how did you do that best? Uh, so let's look at the different ways that we take advantage of that atom parity. So before you arrive, it's good to have some cognitive substrate and some familiarity with what the cl closure language is, even if you don't learn all of it just by this book. And we recommend Closure for the Brave and True. About 80% of people at Imperity have done that first. The great part about this uh, whimsical, immersive, really engaging book is that you can read part of the book and actually still be functional. You don't, have, you don't need to get much, you know, much further beyond uh, the functional chapters uh, before you end up in atoms and refs and agents and all that, uh, but you can start get, get going really quickly. And then, you know, many people have started at Imperity with the joy of closure, some because it was out a lot earlier, but some also prefer to go deeper. And the great part about that is when others ask why, you can actually tell them why, why it works that way. So it's a much deeper treatment. Um, and there is actually a 24-hour course that I learned about at the Seattle Closure Meetup about a month ago, and that is uh, written by Tim Prattley of Professional Closure and Alango Sharon of, um, uh, what's his blog name? Anyway, it's uh, Structured Sequences. Damn, I'm sorry, Alango. Uh, it's a great blog. Uh, these two have actually combined to, to write a 24-hour um, a closure course where you actually watch videos, do exercises, and in 24 hours, or maybe like two 12-hour sessions, learn closure in this style. We have someone joining on Monday. He said, forget your brave and true. I'm going to do this one. And you know why it's great? Because it introduces the professional elements of closure early. It introduces testing, build frameworks, and that stuff right away. So go check this out uh, if you are a learner, refresher, want to teach someone. This seems like it's actually quite promising. OK, for the tinkers, maybe someone doesn't want to do any of that book learning, or maybe they've done the learning they want to play around a little bit. Um, has anyone seen foreclosure? Anyone? OK. Good, all right, we have, that's uh, about 80% of people at Amparity also start using foreclosure. It's a series of kind of like homework assignments that builds up from simple to complex that allow you to, uh, you know, evaluate against a series of unit tests and compare your solutions in code golf with, you know, the alphabetically first people in the giant list. So that's a great thing to, to learn from. And closure koans, has anyone played with closure koans at all here? A handful, yeah, I think that's, this is actually great. You're doing closure a little more in situ. You are writing, uh, actual closure files, and uh, something like a line test refresh is actually running in the background and telling you which ones you've gotten right. So you can actually blitz through in a few hours the you know, 100 to 150 different functions and macros that you're going to be familiar with as you do your development, which means you know about 10% of the standard library. So that's pretty awesome too. Uh, a book gets you familiar with the, tool the, the tools in the toolkit, but you actually want to see how it works. And this is about landing someone at Imperity. So you're new, you're nervous. It's your first day. You're not going to be an expert in closure in a month. You need the supportive community. You need the space. You need the time to get good with closure. You need time, but you need structured time. And that structured time is Facebook boot camp. Hoo -ah! The only laziness I want to see is sequences. <laughs> Are you a sequence? That's where you say no, sir. Are you a sequence? That's right, you're a set, you're an unordered collection because none of you is special. <laughs> this program was stolen from Facebook and expanded, and that lady's also yelling about monoids instead. Uh, it's a 13-week program that starts the very day you end up at Imperity, and it looks like this. Your first week, uh, you hit the, hit the pavement here, you are doing your, signing your forms, doing your brainwashing, but most importantly, you're getting your tools set up. So you want to first find an expert in your IDE. Uh, we, you, you have experts um, who can teach you the right way to do things. Uh, sometimes tutorials are useful. Sometimes you want to know where the landmines are. So it's really important to get your IDE uh, integration working fu uh, fully initially. Clojure is a language about data, and in some ways the UI seems the furthest away from the data, but it's actually super accessible. It's a great tool set in Clojure to get started. So the goal for the week, for the week is actually get your hands dirty and fix a small UI bug, and there's a great path to success. The opinions have coalesced here to uh, mean that using Line, using FigWheel, which is fantastic, using the REPL, and in our case, uh, something called Admin REPL I'll talk about later, and Finagle means that you can actually play in the REPL, play in the browser, have something with a really fast feedback loop that you can fix quickly, and your goal for the week is to have your tools set up and commit a single closure or closure script fix. That's week one. Now week two, you're looking for your team. Weeks 2 through 13 are a tour, a whirlwind survey of all the different teams at Imperity. 
uh, there's a certain amount, a certain sense in which it's also a, a double selection, in which you find out that, hey, I'm a UI person, or I'm an ML person, or I really want to work in the architecture. So it's your search for your BFS that you're going to work with on the sub-teams at Imperity. And what do each of these rotations look like? Well, the implicit goals are meet the team members, kind of get the system, figure out uh, the index of everything in that system, and discover kind of what you don't know. But importantly, Clojure is really, it's really important to read Clojure. It's a tough language to read at the beginning, but then that's actually the, one of the best ways you can actually learn the language. When you, if you don't know a team's code at all, and you're working and you get a bug, which is probably pretty urgent, the first instinct is to go look at that stack trace. And you're gonna be figuring that out kind of top to bottom. But if you know something of the bottom substrate of actually how every team's functions, code, and data work at the very bottom, even if you're not working in that team, it's super important, not only for working with that team, but understanding the, the different ways that people use Clojure. The explicit goals are, in two weeks, take a task, take a bug, uh, turn that into a PR, commit, and release, and importantly, present and teach your work. If you don't teach, you don't learn nearly as well. So this is something we're adding to boot camp, where every week you actually teach back what you've learned. So. Uh, there's another interesting uh, aspect to this, which is there's a core of Clojure that is common to all these systems, but there's kind of different flavors, different wings that you get a chance to experience while you, you go through these rotations. So if you're working on the UI team, you get to taste Clojure script. The pipes team, uh, and by the way, this is the architecture of our system. We're a data processing uh, company, so stuff comes in through the pipes to the left. We do machine learning on it. We build a cool database, send it out. UI on top, architecture on bottom, makes sense. The pipes team is sending data in and out of face, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, <laughs> sending data in and out of Imperity, and uh, you get to an opportunity to work with some stuff like async and IO and that sort of thing. The Stitch and DB teams are uh, the machine learning core of Imperity, and there you get the chance to work on the jobs that run four, five, six hours to actually process that data using, uh, using Spark and using some of these Java libraries. So you get the fun experience of Java and Scala interop, um, but more importantly, you get extensive unit testing. If these jobs run for six hours, you really need to test before they go out. So this is the team that has probably the most, um, the best testing culture, and there you learn to test the right way. And then you hang out in the architecture, you're working in the tools, working in the guts, and kind of at the, the ashram at the top of the mountain where the most experienced clojurians who are building the systems that we all use hang out. And so that's, a, that's certainly valuable in and of itself. Okay, so you've gotten through boot camp, you have this tool called Clojure, you've learned it, now how do you keep learning? Well, code reviews, right? Code reviews is no surprise to anyone, but code reviews are where you kind of get that idiomatic aspect. It's easy to sort of start writing code, it's easy to read code and sort of figure things out, but until you have the bright light of, of uh, everyone looking at it at the same time, you don't really build that, that idiomatic muscle. Half of our reviewers say this is how they learn best overall. Um, the tips are don't limit reviewers to code owners. The best people actually read the code of others', others uh, systems. And if it's a lingua franca, a lingua franca this, is, um, this actually becomes all that much more powerful. And one just like management pro tip, if someone's been working for 10 days on this big change, like don't give it a 15 minute code review because your manager has you doing other crap. Like actually spend two, three, four hours giving the, the, the code it's, de it's deserved. It's deserved because it's, um, that's how you learn, that's how they learn, and you're gonna be fixing it a whole lot less later, which is awesome. Building a learning culture. So sometimes there are certain topics, whether they're imperity specific topics or more meaty, far-flung closure language topics, that even just by squinting at what transduce is, you're not gonna get it. Um, it's nice to go to a blog and see this, but it's even better to say, here's how we use this at imperity and kind of get the rubber hitting the road on that. So, our engineers actually do a lot of time teaching. They are a microservice organization. We're building all sorts of different stuff that doesn't always match up. It's uh, how, do you, how do we build videos, content, tutorials as if we were teaching for each other. So topics that are subtle like transducers, building good macros, using manifold, not obvious on the first glance, but we spend a lot of time building you know, videos that we can then search later. New people can you know, uh, grok this quickly instead of having to go through a book. Um, videos, tutorials are great but there's usually something thematic above that in a larger topic, like a book. Uh, these are the three we've actually had in our book guild or book club where we spend time every week uh, reading. Data Intensive Applications by Kletman is essentially a survey of the technology choices we've made and not made uh, by building uh, our big data system. Working effectively with legacy code, we're two years old, so this is concerning. I guess we just move fast. Uh, and Elements of Clojure, we actually got a sneak peek, uh, but, uh, but Zach released Elements of Clojure full edition yesterday, so we're gonna probably go back and dive in on that. So sometimes this is about Clojure, sometimes this is about other stuff. And then there's Paper Club. Uh, yeah, 
So people came here to learn, and they're not just learning about your system, they're not just learning about Clojure. They're learning with their friends and expanding their mind and coming to work every day to learn. So even if the vapnik chevroninkis dimension is not something that you guys uh, look at every day, it's an opportunity for the, the teacher to really ingest it and teach and make it accessible like that. I think more accessibly is demo day. Every week at the end of the week, we show each other what we've done. This doesn't require a lot of slides and pre-planning. This is crack open the REPL, see how I'm working with my code in the REPL, see what I built this week and how you can use it. Uh, these are all recorded so you can go back, you know, 52 weeks worth of, of videos and see what, what, uh, what's happened and what's changed. And more importantly, or Almost as importantly, this is also a great place for closure specifically, for the PSAs of we're upgrading to 1.8, from 1.8 to 1.9, here's how you do the new stuff. Uh, people might not catch this all the time, but this is a, a good heartbeat for how do you keep up with the language uh, that, that fits into the general culture and general rhythm of the, of the engineering team really well. Um, and it's not too much to take a demo day that's running every week and expand it to the outside world. So having a closure meetup, we host the Seattle closure meetup. We are a marketing focused company, but I don't know where the marketing for seizure came from. Uh, we, are, we bring people in from outside. Uh, they, sometimes we present, sometimes they present, but it's a, it's a great way to engage the community and to uh, harden the teaching, in, uh, in the teaching instincts of, of your team. So look for the Imperity channel on YouTube. There's a lot of great stuff there. Uh, and probably my favorite, and the one easiest thing you can take to your company, is uh, having a Slack channel. Ours is called Clojure Foo, and one instantiation of this is that it's a stack overflow where you can ask any question, you know the quality of the response that you're going to get, and if you don't like it, you can actually walk up to that person and say what's up. You can search for answers that are already there that you might that might have already been answered. Your unasked questions are probably there. You can also take time during your day to like kick back, relax, and read about uh, different ways to, to, do, to do closure um, at, that, at that micro level, consume at your own pace. And people find it really fun. Learners find it fun, teachers find it fun. It's just a fun, engaging way to keep closure. And this is a closure environment thing. This isn't a how to teach. This is a us telling each other how it works every day. There's another aspect to closure foo and that when your, your kind of black belts get together and they have an idea about what they want to expand, they can have that debate in the open. It's not in closed doors. You don't necessarily need to write a whole rationale for it. It's kicking around a new idea. And you can see opinions on both sides. And learners don't just absorb what comes out of it. They absorb the rationale for why people think the way they do. And this is extremely powerful. And again, everyone's reading this every day. So this is a, a lo-fi but extremely reliable way to get your closure learning circulating throughout your company. And of course, there's Clojure Foo, the magazine, right? There's the hottest industry topics. There's stuff, uh, new stuff coming out in your own tool set. And whenever there's nerd drama in the community, and I know that never happens, that's in the society pages right here, and we all get to hear about it. So that's Clojure Foo. Uh, now to actually using Clojure itself. A lot of the things I've said could apply to any language, but what are Clojure's strengths that allow for teaching really, really well? So best part of the Clojure tool set, uh, REPL and immutability. This is... Uh, like last year, Derek asked this and presented this at Clojure West. Our team said REPL and immutability, and we don't expect that to change. Uh, what's the hardest part about working in Clojure? Uh, tests, docs, cryptic errors, uh, no static analysis, hard to set up. Uh, I think this is a little bit more of a scattershot. I think we all feel these things, and this is just what has burned the respondent most recently, that you're going to get a, a more wide response here. So the REPL, let's go to the really, really good parts. Um, I would use the Clojure REPL even if I were programming in Java. This says something about the tool that's very powerful. Whenever I pick up a task, I get, a, I get the REPL running and I try to play with it in Clojure. This says something about the method of Clojure. So the important thing early is to stress REPL ID in integration. It's tough enough when you're learning to switch context between ideas you don't know, let alone switching context between your editor and pasting into the REPL. This is an extremely powerful flow that will unlock you very, very quickly. So, for any component, for any service, for anything that is written in Clojure, step one of documentation should be, how do I play in the REPL? You just finished your, your, uh, your push, you have this new shiny block of code, someone's like, why don't you document that? And the first instinct is not to go Java doc that thing, right? Like that's not where your value is. The value is in how do I play with this in situ in the REPL? That's the number one thing in documentation you should be striving for quickly. So you're in the REPL to deal with data at rest. How do you play with it for real? We've built something at Imperity called admin REPL, which takes it to the next level. So admin REPL is an NREPL process uh, that loads in all of our relevant client libraries and many libraries that we use 
Atom parity puts it, in this case, uh, you know, Aurora has launched it into our actual service environment, and it's always resident. I have a personal Dave Fetterman uh, admin REPL process running in each of these environments. It's always resident. I can go use DTABs and Finagle, highly recommended to talk to other services. I can look at data in production rather than mock data. Um, and the great thing is you don't have to start it up all the time because it's always there. Um, and admin REPL has been a very powerful tool for us. Um, you can use it not just to learn, but to actually do complex migrations, mess with the data. The downside, actually, is that it's so powerful that the REPL means you might actually write fewer tools for people who are not Clojurians, right? As, if someone's using your, your system and you end up in the, the pattern where it's like, oh, hey, can you, can you fix that? It's like, oh, I'll just crack admin REPL and do it because it's so easy and awesome. But you actually want to write other tools on top of this and not just rely on the awesomeness that is Clojure. Um, line monolith, has anyone used line monolith here? Has anyone heard of Line Monolith here? Okay, it's just a smattering. Line Monolith is an open source system that uh, we've created Atom Parity to deal with the fact that we do have a lingua franca, we do have many separate services, but we want to deal with them as if they were one project using all the great aspects of that, you know, a single GitHub repository, being able to commit things jointly and in theory roll back things jointly, uh, having separate project.cljs managed by a master project.clj that essentially snapshots the versions of each of these services running at points in time, uh, or the code at running, or the code versions at points in time. This means that you're spending a lot less time on setup. You're able to check out a few versions of different, uh, different services, play with them together, and then commit those together. You're, you're able to test just what that service uh, relies on when you make changes in that service. Less time on dependency hell. You can build your world, you can test your world, and deal with the whole code base as a useful monolith without incurring a lot of the downsides of having a monolith. Uh, finding the right tool for the job. This is, uh, this is types. Um, always an interesting topic when it comes to Clojure. We have APIs. They uh, have signatures. They need a way to talk to each other. We use Thrift for that. So let's say we're setting the Spark configure for one of our, our Stitch workers. There's a Spark config request and a Spark config response, which has to be specified in Thrift for what that means. And Thrift is, you know, this sort of wire protocol that gets really deep into you know, the sizes of everything and exactly what the structure should look like. Doesn't have, you know, might have optional, but doesn't, doesn't have too much in the way of really meaningful, useful pieces that allow us to iterate and test on this. And this also means that when we ship a service, we have to ship a client and there's dependencies and it's a big pain in the butt. So what do we do? Well, we created a new thrift type called Eden. Does anyone have a guess what type Eden is? It's a string. It's a string, sorry. Yeah, it's a string. Uh, this just means that we've taken some Clojure Eden and we are going to, instead of specifying in Thrift exactly what's gonna go into this, we're going to defer to Clojure spec. Having Clojure spec sit at the interface boundaries means that you can change things a lot more easily. You can also use the much more powerful facilities of validation in Clojure.spec, which actually works at the right time, and document around Clojure spec and have people learn in a single location rather than disperse these types to the wind that don't actually get us anything when reifying them in Thrift. Uh, testing is documentation. This is one of my favorites. We don't do a lot of great documentation. We're moving very fast. There's a lot of great high-level rationales for why we're doing what we're doing. But again, when we have shipped a service, we don't spend a lot of time Java docking and um, doing version 0.1.5 and compatibility and all that. Like, we're mostly focused on building the, si the, the systems and services. So something like this. If there's something called tables with semantic as some function, um, I don't know what that does. It looks kind of small. Uh, I could document this thing, but instead, if there's a test that I've written, I can go in and read this. So what do we know about tables with semantic? It looks like you know, it's, it takes, two, takes trees. Uh, there's a domain child, a tables child, and they have a, an array, or I'm sorry, a vector of uh, different other things, look like tables. They have names and they have semantics. The semantics could be em uh, missing, it could be an empty set, it could be a set full of stuff. And it looks like um, looking, when we run this function, we're going to get the ones that have append only in, uh, in some of them, right? So it looks like you know, X and Y are being treated uh, rather similarly in this bag. It looks also like uh, this function is returning a string uh, of each of these names, which means these names are either being printed or they're being used as identifiers or keys somewhere else in the system. Imagine writing that out in a set of paragraphs. You're not gonna read it, right? It's, you're gonna glaze over and it's gonna change too. When you write a test, this basically says the entire thing that it does. And this is especially important. This is a very domain-specific 
function, obviously, but you know, closure is designed to be a bunch of small functions that compose together. Even it, within a namespace, a function can be used in a lot of different ways. So rather than documenting all the possible ways it could be used, or talking about it only at the top level, a test is a great way for a noob to learn, whether you're a total noob or a noob to that area of the code, to learn what the hell this thing does. And that's why writing tests is a very recommended piece of bootcamp. It's a great way to learn, and the fact that closure is immutable, it, that uh, you're writing small functions means that you can reason about it a whole lot better. And tests are great documentation. Uh, so how do we double down on tests? In the same analogy between using the closure REPL locally and using admin REPL on the, the actual servers, um, we have our you know, unit tests locally, but Greenlight uh, addressed what we felt was a weakness or, or something missing in the closure community, and that's a really good set of integration tests, or an integration test system. So there's a big, chain, a big delta between running something on mock data and running something actually on your services in situ with real data and, and a real adjoining services as an integration test. This is a common framework for all of our tests built on a component with composable steps. Necessary things like setup and teardown, so each test is not a completely isolated world. Uh, this is an open source thing that we've developed, which uh, you should check out. Um, and this, this opinion, this synthesis of exactly how we think unit testing should be done, has moved us from having a few series of scattered unit tests where they haven't developed the right uh, functional substrate to we use Greenlight. Like, that is an opinion. That opinion is super powerful. Right. Again, I don't think opinions are the problem necessarily in this room, but uh, having an opinion about how to do something is really important for a learner. Learners need teachers, and teachers need opinions, even if those opinions don't always agree, because those allow you to build a path for someone to learn this area without worrying about whether they're making the wrong choice. Has anyone heard of the Lisp curse? Okay, a few of you. Yeah, one of my guys turned me on to this uh, very recently when we were talking about basically this presentation. And the Lisp curse is written a while ago and it's here. Lisp is so powerful that the problems it has really aren't about it, what it can do, but, but how the things that people build in this powerful language work together. So they're social issues. Uh, and this means that you know, when someone sees Lisp or sees Clojure and says, I am a god, I can do anything. I can reimagine the world as I want to have it rot and it will flow from my fingers. That's why we got into this job to some extent, right? That's why we play, that's why we're computer scientists because we can do a lot even as individuals. But integrating that into the rest of the world is actually still an unsolved difficult problem. So this means that you end up with proliferations of, uh, of frameworks and options in languages that are really, um, really powerful and expansive. So I think a recent parallel here is JavaScript. So JS is very open. With Ajax, JS suddenly got very powerful on the front end. With Node, JS is now crowned as a full stack language taught to boot camps, very impressionable, who uh, say, okay, there's a way I see to do this with this new powerful tool set, what will I do? So building a JS-based web app is terrifying. This is what my last company was working on, frameworks to, to resolve this. You have to make choices for every single one of these dimensions. An MVC, how you, how you embed it in a mobile native app, like running tasks, packaging, package managers, say nothing of, of even the back. Sometimes this common tool explosion, sometimes these things don't actually work together, but a lot of times they do. And you have people running through all these different paths, which means you get this key green explosion of different options, which is just the power of the choice uh, Meme is one attempt, but it kind of has a natural cap for how much it can scale, especially in my opinion, on the uh, mongo side. And this actually applies to other industries too. We work in the marketing technology industry. The marketer has to choose among these thousands of options to do each of these like 12 boxes or each of these 50 boxes or something. And uh, they just don't know what the path should be. They want to get their job done. They don't want to learn all these technologies. What's a successful framework that actually has a very clear path? Something like iOS, right? Or, or Apple developments. Like for all the things you might not like about it, it basically has one main editor, one compiler back family of display frameworks in which the right choice is basically obvious. You have to deploy through Apple, there's one family of hardware, one place it's distributed, and even they decide which things are going on the store. So you might call them decrees, but at the very least they're opinions, and that means that there's a funnel towards one path of success that even if it's difficult, that everyone is going through learning and teaching each other on. Clojure has opinions too. We see these in a lot of lectures. These things are usually pretty good. These things are usually pretty bad. Sometimes this is declared at the top level. Sometimes this is shown actually in the implementation of the language. I think the at is there to make me feel bad when I write an atom, right? I'm reading the code, and there's a big wart right there, and it's like, what are you doing? It's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm holding state. It's like, all right, let's think about that. But it makes you feel bad. Transients literally share a name with bums, right? So writable, writable uh, data structures like this, it makes you think about it, right? I'm not the designer of the language, he's probably here somewhere, but uh, 
I don't know, who knows? But Clojure has one kind of great straight line path, a really good build tool with so much stuff built in. Clojure Script is a total no-brainer for the front-end development. Figwheel's such a great tool, I'll keep talking about it. And there's obviously one IDE you want to use with Clojure. So there's a clear path that someone who's new <laughs> can learn. I wrote this in my notes. I don't even know if he said it or not. I watched a bunch of his talks, and I'm like, he either said that or I thought that, but it's a mis misattributed Rich Hickey quote. What are your opinions at your company? Start with something dumb like, or dumb, small, whatever, like style. Uh, we actually have our own fourth CLJ format with our own rules uh, because that's our opinion. And we shame people on a monthly basis when we look at which, how many lines do not conform to CLJ format. Uh, this might seem meaningless, but Clojure's about reading code. And if we think there's a way our code should look, that means there's a way a code should be read and an easy way for a learner to get that code. That's an opinion. Naming, always you know, the bugbear of software development. We must have had like a two month debate at one point about how to name keywords. It seems trivial, but especially when crossing service boundaries, the means by which you do your naming really, really matters. Now there's documentation on exactly how to do that. Perhaps the most meaningful reification of this is what actually your abstractions are. And a parity service base has an opinion because it's a tool and it says, you will build your services based on Stuart, Stuart Sierra's component. You will have this hook in to remon for metrics. You will have uh, a data port export uh, via the system that we've built. These might not be the only way to do it, but this is the opinion we've chose. This is what we centralized on, and this is what new learners learn. They can, we can, we're always open to changing this, but centralizing and making your opinions real actually is super powerful. So where do these opinions come from? They come from everywhere, but really they come from your stars, right? A lot of the people who are deep in the architecture, the guy who has closure tattooed on his arm, that's the, that's the person you should be looking to for synthesizing and providing the opinions. We've had, you know, Greg Look, Alex Engelberg, Engelberg Mike Fikes, a lot of great closure stars, you know, work at the company, and don't be afraid to centralize around your stars. That doesn't mean that other people don't have good opinions. That means look to them to lead the way on those opinions. So here's some other opinions. Uh, immutable data structures don't work with Spark that well. They don't represent the best way to use Spark. We use a lot of Spark. We're doing that interop bridge. The tools aren't there. Uh, when we have bugs in interop, they're impossible to fix. It's not as easy to do interop as we think. And closure libraries are often new, and they're not totally production. These are opinions that we have. Do you disagree? Well, like, that's just your opinion, man. <laughs> but the important thing is that you have it. The important thing is that you have that opinion for your company, for your learners, and for your teachers. Because that's the way things actually move forward together. So uh, to close, uh, and one of our interns said if my former self was interested in closure, I just say, go work at Imperity. You'll figure it out. And I want you guys to be able to work at Imperity. But I also want you to be able to take some of these lessons and apply them to your own company. Things like, the language actually matters. Uh, you can fly closure as a flag to attract the best people, but you're gonna get different kinds of people to teach them. So the learning environment also needs to be something that's not, that's not a straight line, but encompasses, uh, encompasses all types that are gonna, gonna walk up to your door. And that's not as hard as it looks. There are a bunch of video uh, ideas in that bag right there where people are actually teaching each other. And all the good stuff that they've spent time learning, if they spend a little extra time teaching it, you're gonna get so much goodness in leveling up your learners. Uh, there is using the best of Clojure, you know, like learning Clojure is different than learning other languages because Clojure has special powers. So centralize around testing, centralize around the REPL, don't be afraid to double down on that which makes Clojure unique and special, and have an opinion, right? Like build, even if you don't agree, pick a path, build down that path, and have a way for people to get successful, then branch out into the world and say, you know, why or why not? Um, Thank you very much. Uh, we like, we, we'd love to hear any, any thoughts you have about learning and teaching closure. We think we're building a great organization that learns and teaches closure, but I think you know, we still have the most to learn from you guys. Thank you.